Five Phenomenon Podcast. I am your host, Shane Hazen. Coming up on today's episode is legendary film editor Paul Hirsch. He has a new book out called A Long Time Ago in a Cutting Room Far, Far Away. Um, we will be speaking to him shortly. Um, but uh, first up, uh, for those of you who uh, watch or, or can watch the show on YouTube, uh, which for now we're hoping to get more video elements later, when I say we, I mean me. Um, the intros still have video to them, and if you can see behind me, I am in New York. I uh, got a quick uh, job for a few weeks, and um, which means I am not relegated to watching movies in the 198th biggest market in the United States, which is what Evansville is. And uh, unfortunately, because I was working, I haven't been able to see much. Um, I got to see um, one of my... I got to see uh, Thursday Night Uncut Gems, which just opened yesterday, and um, this is one of the rare times in the last few years when I've actually been in New York or L.A. whenever one of those releases come out, so I'm ahead of you, Midwest, so take that. Um, Uncut Gems is, um, if you guys like the Safety Brothers, this is kind of their um, real mainstream push without really, you know, uh, sacrificing anything that makes uh, makes them them or their movies them. Um uh, as we talk later in the interview with uh, Paul Hirsch, um, he always strives for movies, uh, endings that uh, are both um, surprising yet inevitable. And this one has one of the best, uh, especially along those lines. It's a great, it's a great movie. Um, Darius Kanji shot it. It looks gorgeous. Um, the other movie I saw this week is I finally got to the Herman Melville um, Army of Shadows. And um, I've been trying to get, go on a kick and catch up with his movies lately. It's, you know, such great minimalist French uh, movie making. And it, I got that habit where, especially if you've been working, but just I'm so used to watching movies late, but I don't know if it's just old or what, but like you start a movie, you disengage with it, and you just stick with it even though you miss key details in like the first 15 minutes. So I'm like a half hour in and not barely knowing people's relationship and just because I was distracted, not the film's fault. And um, by the time I got to the end, it was, I, you know, this was, this was the uh, viewer's fault, not the movie's fault that, uh, cause the ending I really liked and I like the movie overall too. I just, I don't really have anything insightful to say about it because I checked out. Um, it's just an unfortunate thing whenever you're seeing such a great movie for the first time. Um, but uh, but being in New York for a little bit, I'm hopefully going to see. Um, I'm going to try to see Marriage Story in 35 millimeter. Um, there's a bunch of stuff obviously playing here that isn't playing anywhere else. Um, there were uh, I want to say at Film Forum there was a uh, Scorsese's uh, n uh, um, not or um, documentary series, and uh, I just missed that. So, but hopefully I'll be able to catch some other stuff while I'm here. <laughs> So today on the show, it's film editor Paul Hirsch. Paul Hirsch edited um, two of probably my top ten movies. He edited both Blowout and The Empire Strikes Back, along with Star Wars, Planes, Strange, and Automobiles, the original Mission Impossible, a ton of De Palma movies. Um, uh, I didn't get to tell him on this, but there's a specific set of film fan that um, is really delusional and just so drinking the Kool-Aid when it comes to uh, the cinema of Brian De Palma, where they think there's something about the way he can be so operatic in a movie, um, you know, tell stories visually and stuff like that. Like, they think he's the greatest filmmaker ever. And uh, Pauline Kael, the former uh, critic for The New Yorker, is one of the great examples of this. And you'll run him on the internet. And unfortunately, I am very much one of these people. So... And what's cool talking to him, you see that he was part of the uh, formative of that. There's, you know, so much of um, the elegance you associate with De Palma's filmmaking is Paul Hirsch, and that that translates to a lot of the movies he's edited over, over time. Um, 
So I should also mention that um, this was unfortunately not one of my best interviews. Um, it's never a good sign whenever you start to realize that you're, um, you're wrapping, your time's wrapping up with the subject and you're running out. And for, if you're trying to tell something in linear progression, uh, I was only at 1982 or something like that. So um, if you guys get the reference, there's a bit of, uh, when I was talking to him, a bit of a Chris Farley show effect going. Um, he tells like, um, and he tells great stories. He even tells a story that um, didn't, make the book about uh, a technical negative screw up in the first reel of the original Star Wars. It's super cool. And um, what's funny is this, this book, um, and, you know, I, I rave about it in the, on the show and deservedly so. Um, I found out about it just because I was going down a rabbit hole of um, looking at his credits on IMDb as, you know, um, jealous unemployed editors tend to do with other editors and or look at the greats and started realizing, like I mentioned, he edited some of my favorite movies and then I looked him up on Facebook and that's when I found out about this book. Uh, I got this book a few weeks ago, devoured it right away. I cannot recommend this book enough. There's, sh you know, Roger Ebert once famously while interviewing the um, Scorsese's editor, Thelma Shoemaker, said that the real people or movie people to talk to, you really want to understand a movie, you talk to the editors and there are so many stories in this from Paul Hirsch. So, um, Again, his book, new book is called A Long Time Ago in a Cutting Room Far, Far Away. I cannot recommend it enough. And here's Paul Hirsch. Do you have that thing um, I've noticed lately where you don't, as an editor, I get antsy at movies over two hours? Yeah, movies are too long now. <laughs> and... The great movies are like an hour and a half, an hour and 40, you know. Do you start mentally trying to think of what you would cut? When you're no, I just, I just know. Well, it wasn't hard in Once Upon a Time because, you know, there was like an hour of Brad Pitt driving around L.A. before anything happened. So, um, well, uh, I want to start. Our um, One of our mutual friends, uh, Billy Weber, uh, I mentioned uh, after I reading the book, I texted our um, – uh, message him on Facebook, uh, being like, "Did you know you're in the book?" And uh, Paul, uh, Paul Hirsch said favorable things about you, and uh, we had an exchange back and forth. And one of the things I said that really kind of got to me about the book is how it's recurring. You mentioned in the book that like getting jobs, like you, you frequently reference that it's sometimes it's hard to get a job, even as someone that that you want, uh, even someone as established and as clearly accomplished as you. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard that from other editors. They found it reassuring. They thought, oh, it's not just me. I guess everybody has trouble finding work. Do you, you, know. do you have, um, do you still get are we, antsy? are we recording now, Shay? Yeah, we're recording. Okay. Uh, do you still get uh, antsy after uh, whenever you're have periods when you're not working? Uh, well, lately I haven't been working. Uh, I've been working on the book. So, um, I've discovered that I enjoy my freedom. And that's good. I mean, what kind of what kind of stuff do you do in your free time? Whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> easy enough. Yeah. Easy enough said. Um, I so don't have to. I don't have to answer to anyone. Be anywhere for. You know, I used to tell people the last few years that I was working. I mean, I'm 74 now. You know, so I feel like I'm entitled to take a break. You know, and uh, it's not like I'm swatting away offers right and left. That's so weird for um, just – well, I mean, I keep thinking like uh, DPs don't have to deal with this. I mean someone like with your IMDb, like it's just it's just bizarre. I mean I mean it, part of it I also feel like comes from some stuff you talk in the book about. Um, there's a great uh, conversation you talk about with Vittorio Storaro where he uh, asks you if editors have styles and you're, you just eventually come around to the idea that, no, we have to – service the film and i don't know if that's the reason why like or just the invisibility of an editor well i think people tend to hire people they know and uh you know most of the directors that i work for are either dead or retired at this point um so you know the younger guys coming up have their own people they've worked with and you know it's, it kind of makes sense but i mean like um you also talk in the book about Brad Bird uh, coming to you. I remember when you were, I saw that you were doing the Mission Impossible movie with him. I thought he it was a 
um, it was a cool film reference to your work with the Palma, but I guess it was just he said you would um, he he just wanted it to look like the first Mission Impossible. Yeah. Well, I thought I might work with Brad again, and then he started another picture, and uh, you know my my expectation was that once you've worked with somebody on a successful picture, they want you back again. And not, so not so much on unsuccessful pictures. Right. <laughs> I mean, unsuccessful pictures you just want to forget everything about it you know? I know uh, it's not a bl it's not a blame thing or anything like that it's just they just want to let it go make it go away yeah but the point was you know like, this is our first picture together and was a big success he was doing another one I expected to get a call you know so I didn't get the call and I wrote him and I said hey what's going on you know and he said uh, we're not talking to editors yet and I thought what not talking to editors what what's that you know I does it does it so, get any easier when you don't? Because I, I, so, I would then have... he, so then he said, "I'm going to hire Walter. He's an old friend of mine, and you know, and uh, I've always wanted to work with him." And you know, so I thought, "Okay, fine." So he hired Walter, and he went, and eventually Walter got um, fired from the picture. Really? So I, I guess I'm glad I didn't do it. <laughs> Is there any, have you found any rhyme or reason why editors get fired? Because it always seemed to me like it was a, um, a scapegoat thing, usually when an editor gets fired and post is just going bad in general. Well, uh, it can be either. I mean, it can be, it can be a scapegoat thing or it could be they just don't know what to do. Or, you know, they, they feel like they have to take some action with a picture that's a stinker. Hmm. And um, they don't know what else to do than replace the editor. Um, that's one possibility. The other possibility is the editor did a poor job. <laughs> Excuse me. And, you know, that, there's a lot of people out there practicing without a license. So, um, you know, I've had, a, you know, you get called in for fresh eyes on a project. And, um, you know, that's how, what happened with Billy and me on uh, World War Z. Mm. Uh, I don't want to cast aspersions. I don't know who was responsible, the director or the editor, but the cut that we saw was not working, you know. So uh, we whipped it into shape in short order. And um, looks like the third <laughs> act, uh, apparently. Yeah, we wound up with a 60 minute film. <laughs> and then we, uh, we tried to make what they had shot work, and it came out to a 72 minute film that they'd spent $200 million on. So they uh, brought in writers and they shot for i don't know for weeks and came up with a great third act so um that's you know it's very uh, rare that they can pull the fat out of the fire that way but uh yeah i mean there's a variety of reasons why editors are replaced sometimes it's political sometimes it's not being such an uh, integral collaborator do you think um do you think you can um how much responsibility do you feel for making a movie good? Well, I, you know, I try to make it as, I try to make the cut as good as I think I can. Um, of course, all the choices that I make are subject to review and approval by the director. So, um, since no two people have the exact same sensibility, it's rare that the director will approve all my choices. Sure. Or, you know, it never happens. You know, so you try to make changes to accommodate the director's sensibility. And if there's something that he's suggesting that I really hate, I try to understand what the problem is he's trying to solve and come up with the third way. Not my way, not his way, but a third way that satisfies him. It also satisfies my needs, you know. Okay. So, uh, well, okay. Um, jumping back, uh, where are you from? I'm from New York. Okay. Um, was it? Or where, from? where? Where was it? Where are you from? Oh, I'm from uh, Evansville, Indiana. That's where I'm actually recording right now. Um, that's where we're. Um, where in New York? Was it Manhattan or? Yeah. Okay. I lived in the Upper West Side uh, with a few years in Paris as a child. But most of my life was spent on the Upper West Side until I, I moved away in my 30s. Okay, so what were your, um, you mentioned you had a, a family friend in the book that worked at Fox who would lend you 16 millimeter prints, and that's how you kind of 
learned threading really early on but do you remember what the yes. movies do you remember what the movies were you were watching uh from childhood or do you remember your first movie my first movie i think was called frogman what's that frog frogman something like that and i was very disappointed because <laughs> it's about scuba divers and uh, i think it was army you know or navy navy divers that does seem like I, a misleading I, title I was very disappointed because I wanted it to be, you know, about frog men, you know, but uh, it was just sort of a, a war movie. But I think I was about six or seven when I saw that. But uh, my first movies that I remember were in Paris because uh, I was there till I was eight years old. And movies were a way for me to keep in touch with America. Because, mm. you know, Paris is a great movie town. And they love Hollywood movies, and they would show them in English, with, with French subtitles. So, I remember seeing uh, Scaramouche with Stuart Granger, and also uh, Ivanhoe was a big favorite of mine hmm. with Robert Taylor and Elizabeth Taylor. And um, would this been like mid fifties when you were in Paris, early fifties? Early 50s. Okay. Sorry, I interrupted you with uh, Ivanhoe and what other else do you remember seeing? Um, an American in Paris. Oh, wow. King Solomon's Mines. What was it like seeing an American in Paris in Paris at that time? Well, it was perfect because my father was a painter and Gene Kelly played a painter and he falls in love with a dancer. My mother was a dancer. So here's a movie, a, a, you know, a love story between a, a painter and a dancer, which is my parents. Oh, wow. And I was an American in Paris. So, uh, do you remember the theater you saw it in? No. Do you remember any of the theaters you saw in Paris or movies in Paris? No, but I remember they used to sell, um, candy and uh, ice cream in the aisles. Really? Have, uh, yeah. A girl would, with a basket, you know, like a straw tray hang, hung around her neck. She'd walk up and down the aisle. This went on for this. In fact, this continued on until I went back there as a student in college. You'd go in the movies, and somebody would walk down the aisle, and they'd go, "Bonbon, caramel, uh, minto." You know, they'd they'd advertise whatever they were selling. And, um, have you uh, have you been to the Draft House in downtown LA yet, or any Draft House yet? What is a draft house? Or the Alamo Draft House. They were one of the first theaters that uh, serve you food, or, or re the recent revival of that, where they have waiters come up in front of you. Oh, I I, uh, I went to one of those theaters, and the guy brought me a check in the middle of the movie, and I I swore I'd never go back to one. <laughs> Actually, um, yeah, I, I had a um, one of the directors I worked for felt that way because the draft house I, I was I lived in Austin for a long time and they are um, run by really great film fans so they show great films and every time I'd mention to him I saw something at the draft house he would just have your exact same complaints like how can you watch because they because they typically would they always come in right at the end of the second act and so something dramatic is about to happen and they just they duck down but they put the check right in front of you so I think it's justifiable homicide. <laughs> uh, so when did you get back to uh, the U.S.? Was this uh, mid fifties? I, I was eight years old. It was nineteen fifty four. Okay. Do you um, do you remember the theaters you walk um, you saw movies at when you got back? Well, my neighborhood theaters when I got back were the Beacon Hotel, uh, Beacon Theater at seventy fourth and Broadway, and uh, also Lowe's eighty third Street on eighty third Street and Broadway. Those were our local neighborhood houses. And in those days, movie distribution was very different. Uh, when a studio released a picture, it would play in Times Square for a few weeks. Um, and then after it had its run on, um, in, uh, in the first run houses, they called them, then it would go to the neighbors, the neighborhood houses, and it would play there for a week Usually a week, I, I think. Kind of like As, the modern platform strategy with the other mo or other like because we're in a small Evansville is a small market, and so we, I mean, besides the wide releases, any indie movies we either get much later or we never get. Yeah, I I can't compare it to today, but this is what went on then. Um, 
So we'd play in the neighborhood for, uh, for a week, and they usually ran double bills. And when we were kids, they would have um, Saturday matinees where there was a children's section. And you were made to sit in the children. You paid less, of course. And then you, you sat in the children's section, and there was a matron, a nasty middle-aged woman in a white, uh, like a nurse's outfit, who would have a, a flashlight. And if you put your feet on the seat in front of you, she would shine the flashlight out and would tell you to put your feet down. Uh, and my friends and I, we would go into the movie at any point. And my friend had a, a recurring... Uh, line that every time we went into the movie, he would lean over and say, "We'll stay for the part we missed, right?" <laughs> so, this was the era when you can you would come in late into a movie and then kind of watch um, watch. But I mean, but the, or did, could you do that with double features where you would? Uh, yeah, do... just they would just play continuously. So we'd sit through the end of the first film, watch the whole second film, and then we watch the beginning of the first film, and then when we got to the part that we recognized, we'd leave. So I guess it was an early exercise in editing. We'd splice the, the, uh, the, the, the beginning of the film onto our memory of the, <laughs> of the back half. Do you remember when you first recognized a film technique? Was it, I mean, was it earlier or later? Oh, much later. Do you remember what it was? Uh, I, I remember being excited by Breathless, Godard's Breathless, but I don't think I understood what I was seeing. I just knew that it was something new and exciting. How old were you when you saw Breathless? Breathless was when I was in college. Okay. Um, did you, um, do you remember like a um, first date with at a movie or anything like that? Uh, actually, I remember taking Susie Rosenberg to see the Ten Commandments at Lowe's 83rd Street. How long, isn't, how long is the Ten Commandments? How long is the picture? Yeah, isn't it? I mean, it's got an intermission, doesn't it? I I don't remember. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Okay. How was it? Or well, how was the date? Well, I think it was. It might have been my first date, actually. And I remember it was on uh, St. Patrick's Day because we went out afterwards and had malteds with green whipped cream. Um, you write in the book that you liked movies growing up, but, I mean, you went to college for, was it art or architecture? Well, I didn't know what I was going for. You know, I majored in music in high school. I went to the high school of music and art. Is that and where you got your, um, you, you seem really knowledgeable about classical music. Is that where that came from? Well, it started then. It's been a lifelong love of mine, you know, I've pursued it my whole life. Uh, my father played the piano and... I had a godfather who was a violist in the Symphony of the Air under um, uh, Toscanini. Oh, wow. Wow. And he he gifted me an LP uh, of Victory at Sea, the, uh, the score from the, the series that they recorded. And, um, yeah, and then I went to high school music and art and were exposed to the history of music. And I got to college thinking I would be a pre-med, but I realized very quickly that uh, going to an arts high school doesn't prepare you to be pre-med at, at Columbia. <laughs> so uh, I quickly realized that I had to change my plans. And at that point, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I realized that uh, I was interested in the history of art, since I knew the history of music pretty well at that point. I, would, I found my ignorance about art to be troubling. So uh, as it turns out, one of the best professors on campus taught um, Renaissance painting. He taught Italian Renaissance painting in the fall and Northern Renaissance painting in the spring. And he was a tremendously uh, exciting and inspiring teacher. And, you know, a, a really good teacher can make any subject interesting. Sure. Um, but it was my fate to meet Howard Davis and... Uh, in the fall, he would spend half the semester on Giotto, and then the other half the semester on everyone else. <laughs> you know, Raphael, uh, uh, Botticelli, uh, Michelangelo, you know, everyone else. There's always that thing with certain professors where even the great ones, like they inevitably, like they 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 show you their at least their taste take up the uh, course, even when they're trying to teach supposed objective history of uh, 
I know I found this a lot in the liberal arts, my, or at least my, my experience with it was, which it's not bad, but at least they're passionate about it. Well, I think he wanted to show, you know, he did a deep dive into one artist, you know, to show, and then the rest of the course was sort of a survey of everyone else. And he did that again in the spring with Van Eyck, did a deep dive into Van Eyck, and, and then the rest of the time on everyone else, Halls, Rembrandt, you know, you know, all the other Renaissance painters. So wait, did you did you graduate or not? I did graduate, and I applied to. I was accepted at Columbia School of Architecture. That's where I got the disconnect. Uh, disconnect there. Okay, so you went to you went to Columbia for architecture. Yeah. So I I, I thought I wanted to you know I, clearly I wanted to do something connected to the arts in some way, and um, but I realized very quickly that architecture was too dry for me, and um, I, I just. I, I didn't have any patience for school at that point. I had just done four years for a bachelor's degree in arts, and I was facing another four years for a bachelor, another bachelor's degree in architecture. And I thought, I can't do this. You know, I wanted to get out in the world and uh, participate. So um, I did. I left and uh, got a job as a uh, shipping room guy at a film company and uh, worked my way up from there. Uh, didn't you have an early job as a uh, trailer editor? Or yeah. Whatever? yeah. Um, the shipping room clerk job okay. came first. Okay, I'm, I'm blanking on the name, but he's, um, I know the one of the trailer editors you worked with, um, does a, uh, he's done a bunch of montages for the Academy Awards. Um, yeah, Workman. Yeah, Chuck Workman. Yeah, he, um, uh, I have a few friends that are obsessed with uh, what is it? Everlasting moments. I'm really obsessed with that. It, and I, I, precious moments. I precious moments. Precious moments. Sorry. Yeah. It is. I know I've gone gone back to it a few times. It's a. Uh, um, was it? A, I mean, but was technique a certain um, at that time, or was it about just getting stuff done or selling? Just trying to find something that would sell movies properly. Well, I was just learning my craft. You know. I was at the very beginning of my career, so. Okay. And you, so you would have um, met De Palma uh, in the, um, uh, kind of in the, was it in the village you guys met where you were first working? We met through my brother, who was an executive, a junior executive at Universal Pictures in New York. And his job was to scout writing and directing talent. And De Palma came to him with a project and the studio rejected it. So they decided to uh, shoot it during my brother's vacation, his two-week vacation. And they, he, they shot this movie called Greetings, about three young guys trying to avoid the draft. And Bob De Niro was one of the three guys. And when they finished, they needed a trailer, so they came to me and I cut the trailer for it. And um, that led to meeting Brian, and, and we hit it off. And then the picture came out, it was sort of a success they got the money for a sequel and um brian offered me the job you know my at my brother's urging i suppose and um that's how i cut my first picture it was called it was originally supposed to be called son of greetings mm -hmm. they changed the title to hi mom which are the li the last words spoke spoken in the film what exactly uh was it about you and the palma that you guys hit it off it so well just personal chemistry. Um, also, he'd been to Colombia, and I guess he felt sort of a kinship with me about that. And um, I was the younger brother, and he was the younger, youngest of three brothers. And we sort of had that in common. And um, he's got a great sense of humor, and we like to laugh and kid around a lot. And uh, it was just, uh, it, we just clicked. So you just had the, or were you, was it just the one brother you had? I have a one brother. My parents divorced and remarried, so I have a, uh, I had a stepbrother who passed away a few years ago, and I have a half brother who's the younger, a younger half brother who's the, my father's son by a second wife. Is uh, your, um, um, your main brother the one that was the film executive? Is he still in film? No, he got out of the business very soon. Oh, really? He, he uh, uh, so, yeah. so, um, you're for, 
were you, when you started out your career um i mean was it what was the um struggles for next jobs like early on i mean was it just that you were waiting for um De Palma to get more projects and hopefully you'd show off from from there or well workman gave me a lot of uh he employed me during the times between brian's movies i was cutting trailers and tv spots um that's how i filled my my i supported myself in between features i went three years between my first two films then two years between my second and third film and then after that, Brian started, started making a picture every year. So I was uh, available, you know, every, and once a year I was working with Brian. I did five pictures with him before anyone else offered me a job. What was the first job, uh, not, not to Palma job? Uh, Star Wars. So you, going backwards a little, um, I've, I'm, you may, I, this may be odd, but I've noticed, um, one of the things I associate with you, um, is, and if, going back to and maybe editors do have style is, um, there's just a certain amount of, you know, you, you may, you prioritize, you prioritize clarity, but there's just a certain amount of elegance. And, um, you know, you always, I always think that a greatly edited scene, um, you just feel like you can't see it would be made any other way. And, and some of your best stuff, I always feel like, like I can't imagine it being done any other way. Um, and I noticed, for me at least, that as much as I like the early films, there's a jump up between um, F Phantom Paradise, Sisters, and uh, Obsession. Was there? Do you remember feeling at any time that you were, you knew you were getting, getting better, or was it just a gradual thing that you just were learning and trying to get the pictures as good as they could be? Um, I always try to do my best, you know, with the, I know I struggled more when I was younger. It got, the, the, the work became easier to me as I went along. So I can't really chronicle my acquisition of skills, but I started out literally knowing nothing. So, uh, obviously the more I worked, the more I learned, but, uh, you know, what you talked about looking at a scene and not imagining seeing it cut any other way was something I stro strove for because I'd heard a description of Mozart's work as being a combination of uh, surprise and inevitability. You mentioned that in the book, yeah. So your first reaction is, oh, and your second re reaction is, well, of course. So that's what I was hoping to achieve in my work, that it would, your first reaction is surprise. And, oh, wow. You know, and then if you think about it, you think, well, it had to be, you know. So, um, so yeah, I'm glad you felt that way. So going to um, the stride where like um, movies starting to get um, measured bo from box office were starting to do well from like Carrie and um, going from Carrie to Star Wars and The Fury. Um, I mean, I just want to say objectively, you were knocking out of the park. Just some of the best best streak of editing of in at least Hollywood history, but. Um, oh. Thank you. Sure. But um, what what did it feel like? Uh, let's, let's start with Carrie. What did it feel like uh, finishing that movie? Like, how did you feel about it? Well, I was focused on my next job because I was very excited about that one. Uh, I had seen production stills from Star Wars, and uh, I was very excited about working on the picture. I was very excited about working for George Lucas because he had done American Graffiti, and uh, I was very excited about working in California because I'd never worked anywhere but New York before. I mean, there was a lot going on that wasn't just about finishing Carrie, you know what I mean? Sure. Um, I, I guess some of this is stuff that you do talk about in the book already, which, uh, again, I, I don't know if I haven't said it to you directly, but it's just not only a great book, but just a book on a subject that there's not, a, I, I'm always annoyed that there's not that many good books about editing out there. And this is already just, you know, m a month after publication already in the pantheon of the great books about editing. Oh, thank you. Yeah. 
Um, I, I, you know, did you ever read Ralph Winter's book? Yeah, I love that book. I have uh, my list is that uh, uh, in the blink of the eye, the Walter Murch book, and the yeah. book, and one of the books you mentioned in this book, the Sam Alstein book, the um, yeah. uh, Cut to the Chase. I've got I got a lot of stuff out of that, but like uh, Sam's book is good. Yeah, but the, I mean, I, considering how much of it was a cottage industry on people wanting to learn how movies are made. Um, I don't know, maybe this is just my professional annoyance that uh, no one pays attention to editors. Well, uh, yeah, I, I hope the book calls attention to the work that we do. I hope so, too. Um, so, um, I've, re- uh, I, don't, I mean, I assume you, you're aware that Star Wars is... Um, kind of like uh what they how they used to describe the velvet underground where they said um everyone who heard the velvet underground wanted to start a band and a lot for a generation of people that was their gateway to learning about movies and there were so many behind the scenes things made about the movie but and including those uh, jw rensler books which you participate in they're great books but even just reading this there's just so many great stories i'd never heard and a lot of bounce about the shape of the um just the rhythmic shape of the movie that we're all so intimately familiar with um i guess could you talk about um i don't know just how it felt um writing writing about this and and reminiscing about this and trying to come up with a narrative of it again i don't i'm not sure i understand the question how did it feel to reminisce about the, uh, making Star Wars? Oh, well, um, well, I knew that, you know, look, Star Wars is going to be in the first line of my obituary, you know. So I knew that in writing the book that the movie that people would be most interested in was going to be Star Wars. And uh, so I just wrote uh, about everything I could possibly remember about the experience. And it was a very... Uh, rich experience i was going through a big time in my life my first child was about to be born and you know and my career was taking a uh, a big change um and um yeah i just you know it was it was an exciting time um regardless of the outcome of the picture so um yeah, I just yeah, I, I you know I left some stuff out actually, because it started to get a little too wonky. And if you're interested, I could talk to you about that. I am interested, definitely. Was, was, right. there, was there anything yeah. specific that comes to mind? Well, did you ever work with film? Is my question first. Um, I was a um projectionist, thirty five millimeter projectionist, and in my first movie, they almost everybody was done with film, but they set up um uh uh. I can't remember if there was a, I, I don't remember what it was, whether it was a cam or what. And because I was a projectionist, even though I was a projectionist in a theater that was already going digital at the time, they asked me to thread it. And I think in the entire process, we looked at one shot just to look for reflection, but it just, it ended up being a um, extra table in the editing room. So no, not really. I haven't worked with film. What I was, what I was getting at is if you know anything about the film process, the film editing process, because uh, and the film printing process, because uh, what George did um, on Star Wars was he was he was doing some very innovative things, in particular regarding the visual effects. He was shooting them in VistaVision, and VistaVision is eight perf with the frame side by side, as opposed to uh, normal conventional. Um, anamorphic which is four perfs and that's what hitchcock shot vertigo in. it was a 50s format that was a little popular for a while yeah they came out with it when they when they feel, felt threatened by tv and they thought well we'll put a bigger sharper image on the screen than anything they can see at home and this will get them to come out of their homes and back into the theaters but VistaVision uh had this much larger area for each frame it was twice the area of a conventional frame and the resolution was that much greater. And George was concerned about the reduction in quality that happens when you do an optical process. The, the visual effects in Star Wars 
were achieved optically. There was no such thing as digital effects in those days. Sure. And wasn't at so, the time, like, Douglas Trumbull was doing 70 millimeter to offset that? He would yeah. Or... Yeah. So Kubrick had shot in 65, and... and uh, um, so anyway, but the point is, what George did was to shoot the uh, visual effects in VistaVision, planning to uh, reduce the, 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 the grading of the image by starting with a larger image. But he was uncertain about how it would cut in with a normal, the rest of the film was shot in, in normal anamorphic, you know, uh, original neg in the camera. So he was unsure how it would look when the shots were juxtaposed. And he wanted to be able to, um, if necessary, he wanted to extract all the shots that were uh, shot on film in the camera, dupe them, and cut in the dupes in case the original looked better than the VistaVision. Okay. Are you following me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so... Uh, in order to be able to replace those shots easily, he decided to have the negative cut in A and B rolls. Are you familiar with A and B rolls? I am not familiar with those. It was a checkerboard uh, technique where the odd, a few number of shots on a reel from one to a hundred, let's say, the odd shots would be on the A roll and the even shots would be on the B roll so that the, uh, the head and tail of every shot in the reel would be spliced not to another piece of film, but to black leader. Okay. So they would run the A roll first and expose the print stock to the A roll. Then they rewind before developing and expose the roll of print stock to the B roll, which would fill in all the blanks that hadn't been exposed. You understand? Yeah. Yeah. So that way you would get exposure on the whole length of the print stock. And but no two pieces of film were joined to each other. They were joined to black leader, so it would be very easy matter to cut into the black leader on either side of the uh, shot you were replacing, and not have to lose any frames or not have to make any splice over splices. This is a, a negative cutter technique that they would do. They would open up the splice and re-splice it because you know the film had to actually physically overlap. Right. <laughs> piece of the next frame which is why you always have to lose a frame when you made a splice we uh, at the theater we always had to deal with that with changeover reels it was always like you'd, we'd cut two or three frames off no just from the beginning well you should have only cut one but anyway oh, we uh, one of it was different manager philosophies we i always tried doing one but it was also i was a teenager with very little control so yeah so anyway uh as it turned out the shots looked fine and nothing had to be replaced but the negative cutter screwed up, and instead of using uh, negative black leader, he used positive black leader. And the difference between them is the shape and size of the perforations. The positive black leader is more rectangular. Is this for the explosion? Is that uh, the Death Star or the uh, Alteran no, explosion? No, explosion? No, no, this is the whole first reel. Oh my gosh. The whole first reel, he used the wrong kind of leader. It's the same negative cutter, but it's different, different, different. problem. Uh, so he used the wrong kind of leader and the, the, uh, perfs on the black leader he should have used are called acne perfs and they fit more snugly over the, the sprockets so that there's no, uh, weaving or, you know, motion in the, in the image. And, uh, they're what you use when you're using black leader in the negative. So he neglected to do that. So as a consequence, in an effort to avoid making splice over splices, the entire first reel, every splice in the reel had to be a splice over splice. Wow. Um... And then, to compound the error, he used the wrong kind of splicer. There were specifically made splices for um, anamorphic films where the overlap was very narrow so that the splice wouldn't be visible. But he used the standard 35 splicer, and every time there was a cut, you could see a line across the top of the screen. Did this guy so, have a career after Star Wars? I have no idea you, or interest. I was going to say, do you think he dined out trying to tell that I was the negative cutter on Star Wars? I have no idea, nor do I care. <laughs> so they had to print all of Real One with a mask, 
uh, matting out the visible splices at the top and bottom of every cut. Wow. Um, are you familiar with... Um... I left that out of the book because it was too much to explain. And I didn't think anyone would care anyway. No, I'm raising my hand right now. Um, do you, are you, have you heard online of this... Uh, it's a popular format from like the last 10 years. Star Wars fans have been putting out via torrents. Um, they call it the specialized versions of both Star Wars and Empire. And somebody gave me copies of them. Yeah, I mean, uh, before I intervene, you already watched the um, uh, Despecialized. I, I, I always go to the Empire version as my Despecialized, but the um, I hadn't seen the Despecialized Star Wars, and it's uh, I, I just haven't seen it in years. I forgot like the initial rhythms with which you cut the movie too. It was um, it was it was fun. It was really fun. Um, but you had seen it, you said. Well, I have them. I don't watch them. Well, I guess that. I guess that makes sense. Um, the I alluded to it earlier. I interrupted you earlier with it, but uh, the uh, negative, the the messed up negative during the Alderaan explosion. That I mean, I mean, I noticed that as a kid watching Star Wars. I was like, why is there that weird jump in the explosion? Huh. And, I mean, that that story you tell in the book is amazing. Yep. Things happen. <laughs> um. And but there's also just uh, things reading the Star Wars section I found just very emotional. Like um, you know, the format of the movies between the wipes and just or little things like that still evolve to this day. Um, like the iris out at the very end, where you just talk about in the book, like you just casually like like they were organic discoveries that you're like, oh, this is actually pretty good. I guess I don't, I guess I didn't have a question there either. Uh, uh, so, um, going back to, um, uh, I guess the fury next, we should talk about, uh, back to earlier, you said you had a difficulties with some of the set pieces in there, but that's one of the movies. I think if you particularly where the, um, set pieces are amazing and back to what I said earlier about the, every shot felt like it needed to be in there, I guess. Uh -huh. can, can you talk about the challenge on there? Well, the, the idea of making every shot seem like it had to be in there is a trick that you can use even if the director... Now, Brian is a very smart and talented director and knows what he's doing and shoots with a plan. But even if you're working with a director who doesn't have a plan and just covers everything in any way that he can think of, uh, what you can do is use each angle only once and give the appearance of it having been designed to be for that shot, for that moment in the scene only. You know what I mean? so you, no, you that makes sense. It's um, if you don't repeat any angle, people will assume, oh well, it was shot for that moment. You know, that may be what I'm picking up on from you because it's it's especially hard on uh, indie movies when they um they cover everything in um, in a short time when they're shooting. Um, mm -hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, your work with uh, John Williams? I mean, he followed the temp on Star Wars pretty thoroughly. You said in the book, right? Well, at, at times. I mean, and at other times he, he uh, changed it. I mean, one notable exception. I mean, there, there are certain cues that he, he really did write something very close to what we had in the temp. Uh, I used this Benny Goodman tune, and uh, George was about to reshoot the cantina sequence and was designing the aliens that he was going to include, and he had, he had them build... Uh, uh, members of a band and he had one of them playing a clarinet like instrument which i think was it was avalon by benny goodman um so you know john was sort of obligated to write something with a sort of a clarinet like I mean, a reed instrument lead uh for the band in the cantina it sort of came out of the temp choice that we made you know so uh but i used you know bits of uh, Rite of Spring uh, in a couple of places that he followed quite closely. And I used this, a cue from Psycho uh, that he quoted um, deliberately as a, as a sort of a tribute, a tip of the hat to Bernard Herrmann, who was a friend of John's. Who you mention a lot in the book, too, and you had a relationship with. Yeah. Um, but uh, for the moment when the Millennium Falcon is captured by the Death Star and being pulled in by the tractor beam. We had put in 
the approach to Skull Island from the score to King Kong. Uh, I think it was, was it Max Steiner? Yeah, Max Steiner. Uh, and it was a foreboding tension and dark and scary. But John, he, to that, he added an overlay of, of like the Roman Empire with flourishes of trumpets. And um, it was a brilliant addition to addition to the, you know, added to the tension and the apprehension. He had this sort of celebration of the empire and the, the might and power of the empire. Hmm. Was it similar on the Fury where did he um, follow a lot of the temp score on there? Or? Um, I don't, you know, I don't recall terribly much about the score for the Fury. I know that his longtime music editor was not available, uh, Kenny Wanberg. Uh, I don't know why he wasn't available, but um, George Korngold, who was Eric Korngold's son, was the music editor. And uh, he was a very uh, sweet, funny guy who would find these obscure items in the paper and he would read them to you and, you know, and say, oh, really? And say, you didn't know? Oh, you didn't know? He was, he was a funny guy. Um, John, yeah, I don't, I don't remember much about the score, to tell you the truth. Okay. I, um, I should confess to you, I'm recording this in my basement, and I've got three posters up, and one of them I'm sitting right next to is Blowout. But you mentioned in the book that um, you – you are you just kind of mystified that people have uh, come to really love that movie since then, or since it's a. Really... I am, I am, but I'm going to see it tomorrow night, so maybe uh, maybe that will. Why are you seeing? It? Why are you seeing it tomorrow night? Um, there's an uh, event at the Egyptian Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. Okay. They're going to show Sisters and Blow Out. I'm going to do a book signing beforehand. Oh, nice. And... Uh, Q and A in between the two pictures. When was the last time you saw it? When did it come out? Nineteen eighty. Eighty one. I think it's eighty one. Yeah, that's the last time. You didn't even watch it whenever Criterion put it out or anything like that. I don't watch my old movies. That, I mean, that makes sense, but I didn't know if you uh, had to be interviewed and wanted to be familiar with it. But um, you, I mean, did you pretty much else um, put out in the book why you were kind of because you mentioned the book, you like, you uh, make, kept making suggestions about different things, like doing stuff more sound based, and you felt they were all kind of shot down. Is I mean, is that kind of the heart of your uh, indifference to the movie? I wouldn't say I'm indifferent to it. I just thought um, I know the the contortions we went through in the editing to try to make it work. And um, I know that Brian's intent had been to make a movie about an, a, uh, an assassination plot. But as it turned out, um, he really made a movie about a lone assassin, which was, I don't think, his original intent. It was supposed to be a conspiracy. And... Um, well, doesn't he call the, um, or isn't he calling the FBI or whatever? We're talking about John Lithgow here, right? And... Yeah, Lithgow is calling his, his superiors, the guys he's working for. But they sort of disavow him, and he's, he's acting like a rogue, you know, a rogue Asian at that point. Um, but, but, but leaving that aside, it was just, you know, there were scenes with Dennis Franz that we had to... Um, cut in half we use half the scene one pla in one point in the movie and and, and the same scene <laughs> in a different point that was my uh, next question what because you mentioned the book that specific thing cutting the scenes in half and, and reordering specifics. yeah and then you know when we watched the picture initially we found that the the an antagonist was introduced too late and there was no there wasn't enough tension you know so we we worked hard to to make the picture work and then of course when it opened it was a fiasco so yeah i'm surprised that it became uh you know such a favorite 40 years later i remember there i can't remember who wrote it but i saw a good line recently where they were talking about the um 
Halcyon uh, 70 American Cinema, and they said specifically the last three great movie American movies of the 70s were um, They All Laughed, Heaven's Gate, and Blowout. But they were also emblematic of the fact that people, the 70s were dying because they all, all those movies got revivals much, much later in, in their reputations. I don't remember They All Laughed. Who, who directed that? It's a Bogdanovich's movie he made with Dorothy Stratton. Oh. It's a pretty charming movie. I mean, I, I mean, I like it a lot, but... Heaven's Gate, Heaven's Gate is a mess, but it's gorgeous. Have you ever seen um, online? Um, I've never watched it all the way through, but uh, Steven Soderbergh took uh, an old cut of it and just cut it down to ninety minutes. No. Do you? Um, do you? Having. I'm not a film scholar, as you can tell. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm just one of the. You know, I'm a worker out in the field. You know, and I just. I, I finish my job. I go to the next one. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not really a student of cinema in the way that uh, many of the people that I, I'm talking to now are. So oh. I hope you forgive me for that. Oh, of course. Um, do you um, do you having started out in film? You make a strong emphasis in your book about first cuts and showing first cuts to your director. Do you um, do you feel really strongly about your first instinct, or do you find yourself reworking stuff much? Um, especially in digital era. No, I, I believe in my instincts and, uh, I follow my instincts when I do the first cut. So, um, usually the, here's the thing though. The first cut is not what I take great pains to explain in the book. The first cut is not the way I think the picture should be cut. And also explain that editing is only partially editing. And in, in other words, what editors do, what we spend most of our time doing on a picture, is building, not editing. Mm. So uh, we're looking for, we're rummaging around in this big box of parts that we're given. We're building a gizmo from these parts that we're given, but there's just a lot of extra parts in the box that we have to ignore, you know. And so we build this thing, and my first cut is sort of getting the thing up on its legs and looking at it. So you can see how you, how to begin the editing. You don't begin the editing till you finish building the thing. So um, one of my frustrations about working on these visual effects films is you have to start editing before you finish building. Mm -hmm. uh, also, is results in a lot of waste because you spend time finessing stuff that ultimately might not be even the picture. You know. So, um, but anyway. The first cut is your first look at what have we got here? What are we working with? What, what, you know, where are our problems? And um, I've worked with some inexperienced directors who don't understand the importance of that. And um, they're blinded by their obsessive compulsiveness or whatever it is. Uh, I work with some directors who like to polish the film before they've even watched it, you know, which is a rookie, mis excuse me, a rookie mistake. As opposed to getting it in front of an audience, or even if it's just in the room and watch oh. and see what it is. Yeah, just look at it first and identify what the biggest problems are and tackle the problems in order of magnitude, not in scene order, which is absurd. I mean, if you have a problem in the end, you, you don't spend eight weeks fussing around with the beginning of the movie, you know. Um, so, um, yeah, you identify what the largest problems are and you work your way down in orders of magnitude to the less, you know, until you're dealing with tiny little stuff. Um, and that's when you polish the picture when you're dealing with the, the last, you know, the smallest problems. Uh, it's important to tackle the biggest problems first. So, um, around, was it, um, was it Blowout was your last movie in New York, and when you made the move to L.A.? Actually, it was one episode in Creep Show that I did in New York. It was my last that job. That was the last one, sorry. Cool. Yeah. So what was, um, um, did you, I mean, what were your movie like, or what are your movie watching habits during the 80s like? Were you, was it, were you taken over by the, um, were you still discovering stuff? Were you watching a lot of uh, what the industry was showing stuff, or? Yeah, I'd, you know, I'd keep up with what was coming out all the time. 
I'm, I'm kind of pushing your um, time on this, but I don't realize I'm only at the 80s and we haven't talked about um, your work with Herbert Ross or anything like that. Um, but um, I guess um, you, I mean, you, you, you talk in the book, not, not, I guess I have to jump too farther ahead, um, about um, your last movie with the Palma was Mission to Mars and you thought it was a sour disagreement that caused you guys not to work uh work together again well it was partly that i mean you know we sort of quarreled or whatever about the score you know but um i think it was more you know we got over that and uh, i think it was more a function of the fact that he was he didn't work in california beyond that point and uh i was living in california he was in new york or in europe and because uh, black dolly is like his only other studio movie after that point right i don't know i haven't tracked his career that closely, but um, I know he was working in Europe. And in fact, he offered me some jobs, but then I had to write back and say uh, he had to hire a European editor because the money was coming from European sources. Um, so, you know, I think we would have worked together had we been, if I moved back to New York, you know, I'm sure I would have worked with him again. But uh, it's just, once I moved out here, we only worked together when he was doing a picture out here. Okay. I watched his most recent movie that seems like it got taken away from him, and it was fascinating to watch the pieces, but see that they weren't, it didn't seem like they were put together in the right or, right way they should have been. Well, that's too bad. Yeah. Um, Very fond of Brian. So you kind of um, consider your career right now, you make the uh, crack that is of elder statesmen, but you also do a lot of film doctoring? You come in on a project and just kind of, I mean, how long do you are you usually there on those? It, it depends. I was on Life of Pi for two weeks. Um, I was on um, Gatsby for longer than that. I forget exactly six weeks, something. I'm not quite sure. Um, you know, you can work very quickly um, on on computers. You can go very fast. Sure. Is it um is it you get these jobs because your reputation precedes you or just because you've you've you do you feel like you've developed a career niche doing that now? Uh, well, you know, again, it's like whatever comes along. If I get offered, if people are going to pay me to look at their movie and tell them what I think is wrong with it, I'll you know I'm open to that. Well, um, like I sit here and you know, look at all the jobs that are available to anyone in Hollywood and make choices about it. You know, you can. You can only uh, choose from what's offered to you. Sure. Um, uh, I just wanted to say that, uh, again, I r really love the book. I've been recommended to everyone, um, uh, especially editors. I find it very definitive. And um, I know just talking to friends who just read, like, the introduction alone, it's, it's very – It's you, you say a lot of things in the book that um, – that I, I'm just glad someone said out loud because there's always like, I guess one of my last questions for you is um, yeah. how do you, how do you make sure to get your opinion out there to a director and keep pushing and without looking like someone who's a curmudgeon, someone who doesn't want to be, uh, um, doesn't, people don't want to work with who's our opinionated person who does that people don't want to work with. Well, I don't know, because apparently nobody wants to work with me these days. <laughs> well, do you, but don't you find that a lot of editors suffer from this? Because I know, I, I don't know, I do. I feel like I do. Um, I, I worry about it. Yeah. Well, you know, our job is to tell people the stuff they don't want to hear. So, uh, you know, it's it's tricky. Um there's definitely a certain amount of uh, professional masochism that someone uh, someone like uh, brings people to this uh, profession, I guess. But well, I don't think it's masochism. I think you know, if you're, uh, I, I don't know, it's you know, the egos are tricky, and you're dealing with creative people who, uh, um, you know, I always felt that since I had no power, I could argue my point forcefully but i guess there are people who feel like i should just shut up and do what i'm told you know so but that never i mean eventually i'm going to accept that you know i 
recognize the authority and was you know the right of the director to have it his own way but uh, if I think they're making a big mistake I'll I'll speak up about it you know uh, I have nothing in particular to gain gain by it other than trying to make the movie as good as it could possibly be you know nobody's gonna nothing's gonna accrue to me uh, if my idea is accepted or not you know um, so just approach every job the same. You try to make it as good as you can. Well, sometimes the obstacle is the director. <laughs> I, yeah, we could talk. Um, um, I, I was always fascinated early on when, in my career where the people talked about the dealing with the director was way, a giant chunk of the job, and I, it took me forever to really distinctly understand that. I thought the point was to make the movie good. Well, it is. You have to, you know, your obligation is to the project, and you're also obligated to fill the director's needs, whatever they are. Well, Paul Hirsch, uh, I want to thank you for for coming on the podcast, and uh, again, thank you for writing this great book. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for the for the praise. Sure thing. It's well deserved. Thanks. <laughs>